Oh, here comes a sick one. Welcome to The Hole Down, the show that celebrates everything about surfing except snakes, drop-ins, wax scabs and nipple rash. <laughs> Today we'll be diving into another big countdown of the sport's biggest moments. I'm your host Ronnie Blakey, WSL commentator. This is my co-host, a man that still rides down to check the surf every morning wearing a Gap helmet and Garfield pyjamas. <laughs> I do love lasagna and hate Mondays, Ron. Well, Fair cool. Yeah, very fair. Mm. But today, Vorno, we're not talking about lasagna. Today, we're celebrating some monumental championship tour performances. This is going to be mad, this episode, because the tour of the professional era started 42 years ago. That is a lot of room for mind-blowing moments and legends pulling them off. That's right, Vorno. The tour started in 76, the year you were born, and oh, um, it was Peter Town then who made his mark in that first season, the master of the Soul Arch, styled his way to a world title. Love Beautiful those pink stuff. boards, PT. Yeah, the Soul Arch. But today, we're talking about modern history. We're going to have a look at some big performances from the last decade. This episode is presented by Rip Curl. So let's rip into it. Five. Yes, number five on our list, Vaughan. It takes us back to 2016. And one of the battlers on the championship to a breaking through for that first sweet victory. Oh, mate. Matt Wilkinson, everyone's favourite surfer for so long for so many different reasons. I mean, he always paddles out with a smile on his dial. He's always one of the standouts in every single surf he goes for. But he just couldn't put it together in a CT heat, could he? He was just scratching through year after year. And I think in his first eight years on tour, he only cracked the top 20 once. Yeah, but this changed everything. I think he employed the helper of coach, super coach, former CT surfer Glenn Hall, and something changed in his mind. He suddenly had that belief that he could go all the way. Don't know what it was about Micro. He was good on tour, but he has been the super coach ever since, and whatever he told Wilco worked, because in 2016, Wilco came out of the gates all guns blazing. Yeah, there's nothing better than watching someone capture their first championship tour win. And Wilco's was special. In fact, so special, he kept the jersey on for about two weeks after the event <laughs> as he took the lead on the ratings. I just remember his performance and his run through that event never looked like it was going to get beat. He was just flaring and those tight little snapper backhand pockets were just flaresville. Tail out the back, tail out the back, jamming it in the pocket. Wilco on some sort of mad tear. Where did it come from? Who knows? <laughs> it was within him. He did wrong. He took out Taj Burrow, Adriano D'Souza, and Felipe Toledo, who was on his way to a pretty strong finish as well. He has actually gone on to dominate Snapper in recent years. So an amazing result there for Wilco. And all of a sudden, here he is, the guy from Copacabana, sitting at number one on the world ratings. Amazing. I mean, prior to that victory, he was more famous for rollerblading through event sites than he was for winning seats. <laughs> he had a nice perm too there for a little while. But you're right, it was just so good to see the clown prince of the tour finally nail a win and get to where everyone knew his full potential lay. Yeah, and it didn't take him long to get that second victory, did it? Well, this is the mind-blowing part because putting back-to-back -back wins together, as anyone will tell you on tour, is almost impossible. Not many guys have actually done it in the history of pro surfing. Wilco, after winning Snapper, comes down to Bells, whole different kettle of fish. I mean, the one thing that was similar was he was going to be relying on that backhand again, and he actually brought it to the party. Big time! He goes all the way to the final and is victorious, overcoming Geordie Smith in the last head of the event. Geordie's the, the guy everyone's pegged for a win. You know, Wilco is given very little chance of winning, but it was the same story in the Gold Coast. Only a few goofy footers have have actually won on the Gold Coast. And it had been more than 20 years since there'd been a goofy foot victor down there at Bells Beach. That's right. And the final was held in huge surf. And Wilco just teed off on that stuff, blasting the lip. All of a sudden, he's getting chaired up those famous stairs. He cannot believe it. He actually cannot believe it. He's looking up at the sky going, what is going on? He has no idea what he's just achieved. And everyone in Australia and in the world of surfing was absolutely pumped for him. How is it? <laughs> so sweet. 
<laughs> in the end, Wilco finished the year fifth, but it was a sensational start and one of the most mind-blowing CT moments we've ever seen. Yeah, and you know what, Bourne? Once you got that winning feeling, you can find it again. And the very next year, Wilco actually took out the event in Fiji on his forehand. Everyone just thought his backhand was his real weapon, but he showed that he had the tenacity and the fire within to get himself right up to the top end in a stacked field over there at Cloudbreak. On your Wilco, we love seeing the Wilco finally stepping up and on your micro for whispering in his ear sweet nothings that lead to genius. <laughs> well done, mate. <laughs>Welcome back to the Hold Down with the Blakey brothers, Ronnie and Vaughan. Today we're looking at some memorable championship tour performances. We spoke about Matt Wilkinson and now it's time to reveal number four. Ah! Number four on our list, I think is a little piece of history that will never, ever be broken. Mm. It's all about Tyler Wright at 14 years of age, not just winning the, the local board riders contest in the Opens division, she won a championship tour event. Unbelievable. What? 14? What were you doing at 14, Rob? You don't want to know, boy. <laughs> Look, it's not unusual for teenagers to perform in CT events, and we have seen some memorable ones over the years. Steph Gilmore, for example, taking time off school to win her first CT up at Snapper Rocks. Uh, Carissa Moore beating world champions as a 14-year-old. Not getting quite as far through the draw as Tyler, but the big famous one that everyone always refers to is Nicky Wood in the 87 Rip Curl Pro, defeating 17-year-old Dog Marsh, both surfing through the trials in that one, to basically become the youngest ever CT winner. That was the benchmark, but this completely blew it away. Blew it away. I mean, Tyler Wright, in her post lead interviews, you know, she was basically still learning to talk. She was that young. <laughs> The thing I love about this win, Ron, is that it had all the hallmarks of a future champion. Because we're talking about the fact that she wasn't overwhelmed by these heroes. She actually wanted to beat them. And there's no surprises that she was gonna qualify a couple of years later, 17, still a very young age to be on tour, and then win a couple of world titles just a few years after that. It was on the wall all the way back when she was just 14 years old. One of the most uh, incredible things oh, I think we've ever seen, and I think like I said earlier, it's going to be hard for anyone to ever break that record. 14, that is just ridiculous. Imagine going back to school with that winner's check. Hey, can I borrow some money for a pie? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it is time now to unveil number three on our list of memorable CT moments. Three! Number three on our list of memorable Championship Tour performances belongs to Bethany Hamilton, the most inspirational surfer maybe of all time. Well, I think everyone connects with Bethany's story. First of all, because she made two incredible movies about it, so we get to know who she is through those journeys. The other thing is, every single time she paddles out, Ron, she blows our minds away, whether it's front side air reverses, getting pitted at Chopu, or doing what she did at the Fiji 2016 Pro. Yeah, it was unbelievable, wasn't it? We hadn't seen a lot of Bethany surfing in the lead up to the event in 2016, and I was there, and one of the things that completely blew my mind wasn't the actual surfing it was her ability to, to duck dive to paddle back out into the lineup she is physically so strong and just doesn't seem to be restrained by the fact that she lost that arm in a shark attack all those years ago yeah and i think what blew my mind was that this was a landmark event for women surfing the surf was absolutely pumping we saw 10 point rides like backside tube riding like we'd never seen before in women's surfing event and into that mix, thrown in with a wild card, Bethany was not just matching it, she was making semi-finals. And that, the entire world was just absorbed by her journey through this event. And every single turn and every barrel that she rode, everyone was riding it with her. And there was really a lot of calls after that event to give her more wild cards. In fact, I think if the wild card system that's in play today was in play back then, Bethany would be on tour right now. Yeah, there's a fair chance that that's true, but uh, Fiji, obviously, it's one of those events where all the world's best surfers are just thrown onto these little islands and everyone's staying nearby. And there wasn't a, a surfer on Tavarua or Namotu during those uh, events that wasn't out there in the channel 
cheering Bethany on to uh, a semi-final finish she got in the end. And uh, the way she was surfing, there, there was a lot of talk about her taking out that contest. Not unsurprising. And one thing that you always hear surfers say about cloud break, it is a monster of a lineup. There is so much space. There's so much water moving around. The reef goes for miles. To have that understanding and to be able to find your position in your first real CT experience in that sort of quality surf is absolutely incredible and just another feather in Bethany's cap. Yeah, Bethany Hamilton, one of the most memorable championship tour performances, but she doesn't stop there. Since then, she's paddle surfed at Jaws, busted air reverses over an Indo. She just keeps producing the goods. Bethany Hamilton 2020, guys. Let's make it happen. <laughs> All right, we'll stick around because after the break, we'll dive into number two on our list of memorable championship tour performances. <laughs> Welcome back to The Hold Down. Today we're looking at memorable championship tour performances. We've already seen a few beauties, Vaughn, but this next one is an absolute beauty. Here it is, number two. Two! Number two on our list belongs to a man who went perfect in the final in Fiji in 2015. This was an event where we saw something that had never happened before in the history of pro surfing. A surfer scoring two perfect heats in the same event. Owen Wright, take a bow. This was incredible. Mind-blowing stuff. Absolutely mind-blowing stuff. Uh, Owen, always regarded in waves of consequence, but he hadn't really broken through and had that big victory. Amazing performances at places like Chopes and uh, yeah, it was great to see him break through, get on a bit of a roll and surf a, a, an incredible event. Just so many high scoring heats. There's something about Owen in, in sizey conditions. Just the, the time that he has, the style that he still maintains. He's a gannet. He's a sweep. He just sails across the ocean like some sort of seabird. He's unbelievable the way he can position and move himself through these heavy water lineups. And mate, I just, when I watched the highlights of these waves, I could not believe what I was actually seeing. The first 10 out of his four 10s in that event is probably, when you compare it to the other three, looks like a five, but it's still a 10 and it just gets better and better and better. Vorno, I've been on the, the championship to a gravy train for a long time now, calling mm. heats with the, the WSL commentary crew. This was one of the most memorable performances I've ever witnessed. And it was a magic finals performance. Owen didn't actually ever need the two 10 point rides. He'd already collected two excellent scores and had Julian comboed. But in the final stages, he managed to find these two magic rides. It's gotta be said that Cloudbreak was sort of the hero, really. It was firing. But Julian, to, to rub salt into the wounds, Julian was paddling for one of those waves, didn't get into it. Owen swooped, like the big bird, <laughs> used those big long arms, scratched into one of those bomb waves, got himself his fourth 10 point ride of the event, claimed the championship to a win, 100 grand as a bonus. History is made. Went skyrocketing up the, uh, the championship to a leaderboard. And uh, yeah, obviously that win set him up pretty nicely for a good run at the title too. Coming into Pipeline, he was right in the thick of that world title race and he was the standout surfer in all these free surfs leading up to that title battle. Unfortunately, as we know, suffered a horrendous injury, was wiped out of surfing for a year and it took a long time for Owen to come back. So, you know, sometimes that commitment to heavy water surfing and even when you're so skilled at it, at any moment, it can make you pay. Definitely. Well, we know that since then, Owen made an incredible return from that injury and actually went on to championship tour success again, got himself some more wins, which was great to see. And we're backing him to get himself back in the title contention as well. to look back on Vaughan, but it didn't top our list of the best championship tour performances. So stick around because after the break, right here on the hold down, we'll let you know what did. Well, 
mate. Welcome back to the hold down with Ronnie and Vaughan. We've been talking about championship tour performances and the guy sitting at number one deserves all the praise because he has put together some of the best championship tour performances we have ever seen. Here it is, our number one. One! Gabriel Medina. <sighs> hey, the Brazilian <laughs> stallion. Just charging his way to CT wins all over the schedule. Let's start with one of our favourites. It was the, the last event of the 2018 season. Great world title race happening and Medina just turned the volume up to, I don't know, 15? Oh, I love this moment. This is a mind-blowing moment and in recent history we've had so many fantastic world title battles but this one just stands out because it is right there. It's right there in living memory and it has sent shock waves of fear into every other surfer on tour because Medina coming into this world title race, he had Felipe, he had Julian. The hype was just at some sort of monumental crescendo. It was just hitting fever pitch. But really on the day, we saw Julian just bravely scratch and fight his way through heat after heat, but Gabe just looked unbeatable. He looked so terrifying, didn't he? Yeah, Mick Fanning called it early, didn't he? He said he, he felt that Julian would get the job done and make that final. Mm. But he also said Medina would be there. And once they were in the final, that's exactly how it played out. It was such an incredible performance because most goofy footers to overcome really good barrel riders uh, will keep their eyes on pipe because it's going to be hard to match a regular footer at backdoor. But Medina just said no to that. He just said, rubbish, and, and went backdoor and completely dropped Well, that's it, it. yeah. He, he looked like he was going to smash everyone in every heat. The only little scare he got was against Connor Coffin. And that was the heat where Connor got a really quick start, two scores under the belt. Gabe almost got to the halfway point of the heat before he'd even notched up a score and there was just this little whiff of hope in the air that Gabe just came over and just snuffed out like some sort of elephant with a trunk full of water. Just <laughs> check you later. It was crazy. Kate got a psycho little barrel at Pipeline, came out through a huge lofty distance covering air and then on his way back out, paddles straight past Connor puts Connor onto the inside of this huge peak and backdoors this way for a 10. That, to me, was the starting point of the end for the world title campaign because after that, all the momentum was with Gabe and it is just unbelievable how scary this guy is when he gets a whiff of blood in the water. If he's backing himself, if he smells that there's, it's his day, game over. He's gonna smash everyone. Medina's got an incredible history at Pipe. He'd finaled there a couple of times before, but hadn't yet had the win. So with the world title pressure on the line, he did break through and get that world title by making the semis. But to go on and win the event, to find the motivation within, in the last heat of the year, to break through, get the victory over someone who's just desperately looking for a consolation prize. And, and an arch nemesis. Julian and Gabby have mad beef. They are always picking the win off each other at the last possible second. And what I loved about Gabe's final performance, Ron, you see it so often, you know, when someone wins the world title, they'll often go on to win the Pipe Masters as well. And Gabe did it again going right, getting a, a high nine on the last wave of the season just to rub a little bit of salt in Joyce's wounds. I mean, it was a hard one to watch if you were an Aussie because there was a real, you know, the, the two camps were vocal and loud and right behind their boys. But at the end of the day, great surfing gets rewarded and everyone can appreciate it. Gabby, how many world titles is this guy going to win? I don't know, but I think that's the most perfect number one of mind-blowing performances because it's right there on the front of our brains and it's going to scare the daylights out of anyone trying to claim that world title off Gabe in the next few years. But it's not the only one we've got for you because Medina just keeps racking them up and we got another one what? in 2019. Gabriel Medina at Jeffreys Bay, an event that hadn't seen a goofy-footed champion since Mark Ocalupo way back in the Ice Age. Oh, mate. <laughs> this was one of the best things I have ever seen because you always talk about who's going to break through, which goofy is going to claim it back off the regular footers on these long winding points. Gabe just set a whole new benchmark and I think Italo is another guy who lifts Gabe, because Gabe really does fire into gear when he's got a competitor who he thinks he can take down, and he has to take it to another level. 
I just love watching those two go at it. Every single turn of Medina in that J Bay final. <laughs> I totally agree with you. You know, he, he always sort of puts himself up against it by having these sl slow starts, these just snail paced starts to championship tour seasons where he just takes so long to get going. Slow starts don't get any slower than his heat against Ryan Callanan where he managed to win it with, what, a minute 30 on the clock? That's just mind blowing backing yourself. How do you back yourself out of a corner that tight? He's just the man, he's the beast, he's the robot. Stay away from him. He's gonna zoom in on your head and just blow it up with his fierce competitive stare. He's an animal. He is an animal and very deserving of being at number one on our list of memorable championship tour performances. That's all we've got time for today on The Hold Down. Make sure you tune in next week as we look at more big moments in the sport of surfing. <laughs>